hello everyone I'm on to video number three now and I have noticed that my hair is getting longer with each video hopefully by the time I do the next one I will have been to the hairdresser today I want to talk to you about a subject um, an author who I love I first came across her about 25 years ago by sheer accident and I've read all her books ever since you may have heard of her you may not her name is Eva Ibbotson. Now, Eva Ibbotson came to England in 1934. Her parents lived in Vienna. Her mother was called Anna Gemena, G-M-E-Y-N-E-R, and she, has re she wrote a book called Manja, which was published by Persephone Books, and that's worth getting hold of. Um, the story in Manja very much reflects Eva's story and experiences in her book, The Morning Gift, about her journey to England. Now, she came from Austria, obviously, and um, her depiction of Vienna and her talking of Vienna runs through a lot of her books. They're wonderful. But first of all, I have to start by saying the first book I discovered was this rather undistinguished looking copy which I came across in a second-hand bookshop. Why I picked it up I do not know, but I opened it. I can see it cost me 90 pence, published in 1981 and it's called A Countess Below Stairs. And the first page grabbed me. I'm going to read a bit. In the fabled glittering world that was St. Petersburg before the First World War, there lived in an ice blue palace overlooking the River Neva, a family on whom the gods seemed to have lavished their gifts with an almost comical abundance. Count and Countess Grzynski possessed, in addition to the 80-roomed palace on the Admiralty Quay, with its Tintorettos and Titians, its Scythian gold under glass in the library, its ballroom illuminated by a hundred bohemian chandeliers, they also had an estate in the Crimea, another on the Don, and a hunting lodge in Poland, which the Countess, who was not of inquiring turn of mind, had never seen. The Count, who was an aide-de-camp to the Tsar, also owned a paper mill in Finland, a coal mine in the Urals, and an oil refinery in Sakahan. His wife, a reluctant lady of the bedchamber, could count among her jewels the diamond and sapphire pendant that Potemkin had designed for Catherine the Great, and she had inherited in her own right shares in the Trans-Siberian Railway and a block of offices in Kiev. The Countess's dresses were made in Paris, her shoes in London, and though she could presumably have put on her own stockings, she had never in her life been called upon to do so. That grabbed me straight away. What happens in the end, of course, um, the revolution and they have to leave. Um, they'd entrusted the bulk of their jewels to the Count's Georgian wet nurse who was sent ahead with the King's ransom in pearls, emeralds and rubies hidden in her luggage. Well she never arrived, she never turned up. And the indefatigable English governess, Miss Pinfold, produced a pocket from the pocket of her childproof knickers the last remaining jewel, the Orlov diamond, and persuaded the captain of a Greek trawler to take them to Constantinople. And a month later, they reached England, and there she becomes a maidservant, a countess below stairs, which, of course, a lot of white Russians had to do at that time. Well, I read that, and then I went looking. And I found this one. Magic Flutes. I'm going to read you sort of the blurbs of these so you have an idea of what they're about. No one could have predicted that their paths would cross. He was a foundling rescued from a Newcastle dockside wrapped in a blanket. She was an Austrian princess, the last of a line of aristocrats stretching back into the dawn of history, heiress to the exquisite castle of Pfaffenstein. Isn't that a lovely name, Pfaffenstein? But Tessa, although born to all this splendour, disapproved of being a princess and left her family home to become a humble dresser in a Viennese opera company. 
Never, she told herself, had she been so happy. It was only when her great aunt sold the castle to a mysterious and enormously rich Englishman that her life began to get as complicated as a Mozart opera. Now, this I see cost me 50p. Look at that. Lovely jacket, the lot. Now, the books were repackaged and rediscovered some years ago, and they were classified as young adult books, which I think is totally wrong. Not that I don't want young adults to read them. I do want them to. But it rather put them out of the way of adults. And look at these ghastly covers. Look, I've just taken a photograph. Can you see? They were all marketed with glam covers like this, which I thought was totally unsuitable. Um, and I was a bit sad about that. In fact, the, most of the books have been reissued now, but they've still got sort of rather airy fairy covers, which I don't like very much. What I have to say about Ibbotson's stories, the word enchanting is a difficult word because it can mean whimsical, fey, and if you're a bit over enchanting, it, it it's, makes you feel a bit like you've gorged on a box of chocolates. But in a post I wrote some years ago, I put Ibbotson's wonderful stories with their atmosphere of enchantment and fairy tale. There runs through them a strong vein of common sense, and this saves them from tipping over the edge. Her heroines are down to earth, sensible and practical, as well as sensitive and loving. There is a similarity of character in most of her heroines, and I can only assume that each heroine in each book is Eva herself wed young. Okay, the next one. Now, this is one of my favourites. A Company of Swans. Harriet Morton lives with her father and spinster art in Cambridge. She is cabined, cribbed, confined, though she's clever. She's not allowed to go to university. She's not allowed to hold down a job. Her only escape is her weekly ballet lesson and she wants to join the Dubrov company on their tour up the Amazon. Well, of course, her father, no, but she runs away. And there are lots of adventures. And of course, she finds love, the description of the ballet, the joy that she finds wonderful. Her father tries, she eventually has to come back home and her father locks her in the attic and tries to have her sectioned because of the scandal that she's brought upon them. Anyway, Rom, who is the man that she eventually marries, that she's fallen in love with, rescues her and he marches into the lecture room where the professor, who is universally loathed by everybody, is giving a lecture. Professor Morton, it is only because you are Harriet's father that I have not actually throttled you. Anyone else who had treated her as you have done would not have lived to tell the tale. I choose to believe that you are misguided, pompous and opinionated rather than sadistic and cruel. But unless you sign this document without delay, I will take you out into the courtroom, courtyard, I beg your pardon, debag you and throw you into the fountain. The look of expectancy on the students' faces changed to one of deep and utter happiness. You wouldn't dare. Try me, said Ron. He looked down at the row of upturned faces. I can do it myself, but it would be easier if I had help. If anyone is willing to help me debag the professor, would they put up their hand? There were 14 students in the lecture room and 13 hands shot up without a moment's hesitation. Then Ellenby, sole support of a win widowed mother, shook off his moment of cowardice and also raised his hand. What happens, of course? He signs his document releasing his daughter and saying she can get married. He was not destined to resume his lecture. Rom might have left the room, but he had shown the students a lovely and fulfilling vision he had unleashed primeval forces which were not to be gainsaid. 
Blackwell rose first, and even when he became a bishop, he was to speak with nostalgia of this moment of release. Hastings followed, then Mosevich, whom the professor had humiliated in front of the entire tutorial group, took off his spectacles and laid them carefully on the window sill. No words were necessary, as every student in the hall moved as one man towards the rostrum. His trousers first, said Bakewell. Start with his trousers. Glorious moment. And this is what I mean about these books are enchanting, but they are shot through with humour and wit, and they are wonderful. Right now, on to the next one on my pile. Look at this lovely cover. The books may have all been reissued now, but I stick with these old copies of mine with these wonderful covers. This is a collection of short stories, a glove shop in Vienna, and they range from 19th century Vienna to the north of England today, from Russia to the Brazilian Amazon. And I'm not normally a lover of short stories, but these are long short stories and they're wonderful. Two more paperbacks that I found, um, which cost me 20p each. One's an X library copy, withdrawn from Essex libraries, which I stumbled upon. A Song for Summer and The Morning Gift. And again, the, the heroines of both of these have wit and style and really feistiness I suppose uh, which is a word I don't like to use but there it is now a lot of Eva Ibsen's books she's written a lot of children's books as I said and you may be familiar because of this and I'm not going to talk about them today because as I said I think her books about her, her adult books are more interesting and this one out of all her titles, and I've read them all several times, this is my favourite, Medensky Square. I've yet to go to Vienna. I have to go because after I've read Eva Ibsen's books, I was filled with such a longing to go to Vienna. She loves it so much. This is set in Vienna in 1911. Susanna's dress shop stands in a delightful square in a city of romance, music and gossip, of secret liaisons and social hopes. She watches over Siggy, the wretched orphan child prodigy, practising his scales for hour upon hour in the gloomy house opposite, in the hope of being noticed by one of Vienna's legendary impresarios. She subtly tries to prevent her fierce anarchist employee from rejecting the excellent man who has fallen in love with her. And with her infallible eye for dress, she turns an ugly duckling into a modest swan. Now, the opening page of this is wonderful. The 31st of March, 1911. I woke in such a good mood this morning. There was a dress floating about in my head, almost ready, almost there. Cream silk the skirt trimmed with tears and tears of rough cream lace, and the bodice tuckered but unadorned except for a single rose. When I went to sleep, I wasn't sure about the colour of the rose, but when I woke, I knew it had to be cream. A self-coloured rose, a little passé, almost blousy. Now, She writes about when she first came to Vienna. I can remember so well how Vienna looked to me when I was Sanna, the barefoot daughter of the village carpenter. The Kaiserstadt, the imperial city, heart of the empire, how it beckoned and shone, how clearly I saw it all. The Kaiser in his golden uniform, waving a white gloved hand as he drove in his golden weaved carriage from the white gloved hand as he drove I beg your pardon, I'm going to start that sentence again. The Kaiser in his golden uniform, waving a white gloved hand as he drove in his golden wheeled carriage from the Hofburg to his summer palace of Schönbrunn. 
And now that Vienna is a real place with clattering dustbin lids and foolish dogs, I love it even more. It was a hard road that led me to this shop, this square. I let no one help me, not even the man I love. But since I came here, I have woken every morning thinking, I am here where I want to be. This is my place. She is the mistress of a count. Sorry, a field marshal, Gernot von Lindenberg. He endured the frustration and monot monotony of the conference table and escaped when he could to manoeuvres in obscure and lonely places. And she sees him when she can. She loves him deeply. He came towards me. He doesn't smile much, my protector. When he does, one side of his mouth flicks upwards briefly, more in sardonic amusement on the idiocy of the world than in amusement. But he has a way of doing something to his eyes, which even after 12 years of intensive study, I have not identified. We took each other's hands, looked. Then, do you like my dress? I inquired conversationally. His steel blue eyes roamed over the creamy folds of silk, lingered in the places where I had arranged for the eye to linger. He stepped back and I turned slowly around. Yes, I like it. Then he said that lovely thing, the thing that women the world over see as the fulfilment of their labours, their just reward. Take it off said Field Marshal von Lindenberg. At once, please, take it off. Well, I hope I've given you a taster of Eva Ibbotson. And I hope that if you don't already know about her, you might try some of these books. I think you will be enchanted. Yes, it's that word again. I love them and in fact just opening them now and flicking through them today to finding bits that I wanted to read out to you, it makes me want to read them all over again. So if I've made anyone interested in Eva Ibbotson and to turn to her books, then this video will have served its purpose. Thank you again for those of you who tuned into my previous videos and have tuned into this one and please leave comments either on YouTube or on my blog and any suggestions about anything else you'd like me to talk about. I mean, I've got a list a mile long. I'm never backward in talking about anything. And it gives me a wonderful opportunity to share with you the authors and books that I love. And as I said, Eva Ibbotson is very high on the list. So thank you, everybody. Goodbye.